Jim Karen is the global head of interest rate strategy at Morgan Stanley. He joins us now from his firm in New York with more. And Jim, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the different parts of the curve because about a week ago, you know, we saw the 10 year, the longer end of the curve, really trading a lot on the economic data. And we saw the very short end focused on what was happening in Washington. Tell me, what's your perspective right now on what's happening in the Treasury market? Is it all about the weak economic reports we've had since Friday? Yeah, I think that's right. You know, if we look at what's going on, uh, you know, last Friday we had some very disappointing GDP numbers. And what we're finding out is that first half growth was at about 0.8%. And even if you take some of the more optimistic uh, forecasters for the second half, you might get to as much as 3% growth in the second half. That would average out to just below 2% growth in the U.S. for all of 2011. And this is a year where we threw a lot of stimulus at the markets, and we would have expected a whole lot more. So effectively, what, what's happening right now is now that the debt ceiling debate is behind us, the market's able to focus on the growth outlook. And I think the market's, in, in, in effect, just downgrading growth expectations going forward. Well, that's an interesting point that you bring up. I was reading your research note here. You know, you're saying the market is pricing in real growth expectations to fall, but at the same time, they're pricing inflation expectations quite high. Why is that happening? It's a very interesting dichotomy. And essentially, the way that the market prices in uh, real expectations for growth is just by looking at real rates in treasuries, which you can you know, trade through the tips market, so it's a tradable quantity. And effectively, right now, real rates are as low as they've been. Ten-year real rates are at about 28 basis points only. That's even lower than where they were in August of 2010 and October of 2010 prior to QE2. And actually, one of the things that might have even spurred QE2 was just the low expectations of growth. But what's different this time is that inflation expectations are running high. And the reason is, is that if you go back to Bernanke during his Humphrey Hawkins testimony, what he discussed was that the possibility of more stimulus if needed. Now, when the market sees stimulus, what they also see is potential for inflation expectations to move higher. So the result has been that inflation expectations have been priced to stay high at sticky levels despite the expectations for a slowdown in growth, and that's a real break from history. So essentially, the entire move lower in nominal yields, the 265 level that you mentioned, um, is primarily driven by real yields in a real decline in growth expectations uh, for the U.S. Let me ask you this. So are we talking about monetary stimulus or fiscal stimulus? I mean, what more can Bernanke do? We certainly know the president has an agenda for right. some spending or stimulus on the fiscal level, but uh, what more can Bernanke do? Well, it's yet to be determined. I mean, there, there are some paths he could take. For example, he could be more explicit about keeping short-term interest rates for a very specific period of time. Um, with the uh, portfolio at, at the Treasury right now, they, they hold about $2.6 trillion in, in assets between Treasuries and mortgages. They can allow, they, they, they can uh, prevent that from shrinking. They can keep that at the same size. They can extend the duration of, or they can change the duration mix of that portfolio and keep it longer duration. So there's lots of different tools that the Fed can use to continue to keep uh, stimulus coming into the market. But effectively, the way that the market prices that and interprets that is by, by placing in higher inflation expectations. And, and that's another tradable quantity that we can get in the markets through the break-even markets, which is also part of the tips market. All right, Jim, I want to hold off for one second. I want to look at credit default swap spreads very quickly. It's something you note uh, in some of your research. We've been looking at the one-year U.S. CDS spread, also looking at the five-year. They were inverted. Now they're back to more normal-shaped curve. Does that suggest the trader's not so worried about a default at least in the short term on U.S. debt? Absolutely. So I think the market's got a little bit ahead of themselves. I mean, we've said all along that there was 0% chance for a default going through this debt ceiling debate. But, but clearly, the market's not going to take any chances. They discounted for some of that risk. One-month CDS uh, certainly blew out to wider spreads. And as you mentioned, that's come back into line now. And, and we're seeing that all across the markets. Even some of the funding markets are starting to get a lot better, and, and, and cash is being freed up and mobilized, which is, which is a good thing at this point. All right, Jim, we got to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. That was Jim Karen of Morgan Stanley.